All right. Um, welcome, everybody. It is uh, a great, great honor and pleasure to welcome you here to the Center for Jewish History and the Leo Beck Institute, of which I am the new executive director. Um, I've been in the job for only four weeks or about a month. Um, it means all the world to me that I'm in this great position. Um, it doesn't mean anything for my relation to tonight's event because I had nothing to do with that. This was all in the making way before I signed on and I will turn over in a minute to Renate who will introduce the team behind um, tonight's event and will introduce Ismar. But uh, because Ismar Schorsch is the speaker tonight, I had particular reason to be happy to welcome you. Um, I'm proud to say that I graduated from being Ismar's mentee to friend and colleague. Um, it is very touching and moving to me that about seven years ago you introduced me at the graduation ceremony at JTS and therefore it is my pleasure to introduce you and welcome you to this event. Uh, this is wonderful. Thank you everybody for coming. Enjoy the evening and I will turn over to Renate Evers, our Director of Collections, who is the driving force behind all this and uh, she will introduce the team and tonight's event. Thank you and welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. So on behalf of all of us, so a warm welcome to the opening of the exhibition Leopold Sunz, Scholarship and Revolution. And so we are absolutely delighted that you join us for this special event. And we are honored, deeply honored that Professor Isma Schorsch, Chancellor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Seminary and President Emeritus of the Leo Beck Institute will discuss and talk about Leopold Sun's scholarly and political legacy. Um, Markus, our new director, thank you so much for the introduction. So my name is Renate Evers. I'm the Bruno and Susanne Scheid Director of Collections at the Leo Beck Institute. The Leo Beck Institute is one of the five partner organizations here at the Center for Jewish History. It preserves the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry through its extensive archival and library holdings and promotes it through events, social media, and an array of projects. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words of thanks and some brief remarks about the exhibition. So it will be really brief. First, a thank you to the exhibition team, Dr. Magda Brobel, you see in the back, who oversaw the entire project together with da David Brown. There, <laughs> our directors of LBI's public history team. And thank you to the close-knit library team, who are going to watch this later, Tracy Felder, our rare book librarian, who presented a selection of periodicals, our preservation and art specialist, Lauren Postian, who expertly worked on the display of the books and documents, our librarians, Liz Fedden and Gay Palisano, created a study area. And thank you to M Melissa Jeverbaum, executive director of the Council of American Jewish Museums, who reviewed the exhibition text and it's now on, that, um, on the conference, the, the Cajun conference. The designer Shana Mar Marquese, Center for Jewish History, developed a beautiful layout and design with ingenuity for the use of the gallery space. And a special thank you to my colleague, our colleague Chris Bentley, our digital and system archivist who, who developed an app in the exhibition that some of you could already see. Um, which allows you to study a collection of calling cards of Leopold and Adelaide Sons in detail. And last but not least, a thank you to all my colleagues at LBI, the archivists and librarians who maintain the collections as a background foundation of all what we do, as well as our social media and event team. We are delighted that we can finally dedicate an exhibition to the work of Leopold Sons, who launched the Scholarly Wissenschaft des Judentums movement. The idea of an exhibition emerged first when we had the privilege of working with Professor Schorsch while he was finalizing his lifelong long research on Leopold Sons, which resulted in his book, Leopold Sons, Creativity and Adversity, which was published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2016. The plan to honor Leopold Sons in a framework of a larger Wissenschaft des Judentums exhibition and conference in 2018 remained an idea. However, 
I was inspired to pick up on that plan when I attended a class at Columbia University taught by Professor Isabel Levy, and thank you so much for coming, and Professor Beth Berkowitz and Professor Clemence Bouloc. Since there will be several exhibitions at the center featuring scholarly movements in the wider framework of the history of ideas this fall and in early 2023, um, we felt that it's a good point in time to highlight the contribution of the scholarly science of Judaism movement and the influence of one of its most famous founders. And thank you so much for our, I mean, our director, Willy Weitzer, supported the idea. And thank you so much, Markus, for picking up on it. However, exhibitions have limits. The history of ideas that is and remains the domain of the word and scholarship. And we will be treated to that in a minute. However, a visualization of a scholarly topic provides a condensed introduction, a framework, and highlights, and maybe the appetite to learn more. Our exhibitions are touches on the early life of Leopold Zunz, his scholarly work, his political activism, his impact, visible in the spread of, of his ideas in the emerging scholarly network, in the emerging scholarly networks. Zunz's work and vision also triggered a discourse within Judaism that transformed Jewish practice, the reform, conservative, and modern orthodox movements. All of their roots have their roots in the Wissenschaft. I just want to share some observations as a librarian who has worked over several decades in academic libraries and special collections with physical and increasingly digital collections. This profession that works hand in hand with the scholarly community has always been, been between content and form, between the intellectual ideas and discourses and material culture. And I cannot adequately express my awe that this powerly, powerful scholarly movement that influences us until this day, manifested in the solid place of Jewish studies worldwide, and last but not least in the very institution that you, visited today, that you visit today, that this scholarly movement has a clear starting point in a very humble, very small book that the young student Leopold Sunz wrote and subsequently published in 1818. It also has a humble title, Etwas über die rabbinische Literatur, something on rabbinical literature, which disguises its powerful message and impact. It is dense, hard to read, but in essence, the request to apply methodical scholarship to Judaism. At, at the time and historical context, a radical request. Zunz proposed the inclusion of Jewish literature in the study of traditional academic disciplines. He also called for the inclusion of non-traditional sources and the study of groups that had, had left fewer traces, such as women, in a footnote. He's good at footnotes. So Zunz envisioned an academic program that should emerge from the Jewish community itself and which was intrinsically linked to an appeal for political emancipation and religious reform. And therefore we are thrilled that you are able to see in our exhibition a copy of that book that had such an impact. Our beautiful library at the Leo Beck Institute with 80,000 volumes and pretty much a full range of the books of the, scholar, of the scholars of the Wissenschaft does not have that copy. And therefore, thank you to Joram Biton, the director of the HUC libraries, who brought one of the few copies that exist from the library collection of HUC in Cincinnati. We had a field day when you brought it over, so thank you. We are also delighted that we can present another unique collection, a collection of calling cards from the Leopold Sons and Adelheid Sons household. There are more than 800 of these visitor cards, which were one of the social media tools of the 19th century. They were used to announce one's arrival or to leave brief messages or to introduce somebody with a reference. It is an exciting source that proves personal connections and encounters between the scholars of the time when Jewish studies had no home in university settings yet. It is a material source that complements the Republic of Letters, the knowledge exchange of the so-called long distance intellectual and scholarly community via letters and printed publications in periodicals and books. The history of modern Jewish scholarship is also a history of shifting patterns of institution building since the mid, mid 19th century, driven by the networks of scholars Rabbinical seminaries in Central Europe and the United States evolved first, and we are honored that we can also welcome Professor Shuli Rubin Schwartz, the current chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, 
which was founded in 1886, and you can also see her on a panel. Secular, self-standing historical and academic organizations and institution emerge next. Leopold Sun's radical vision of the full academic recognition of Jewish studies was realized with the founding of Hebrew University in Palestine in 2425 and the first establishment of a chair in Jewish studies at Columbia University. Today, Jewish studies are an integral part of secular as well as religiously oriented universities around the world and uh, rabbinical seminaries, secular and religious or Jewish organizations and institutions continue to flourish. So far my remarks and thank you so much for your patience. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Isma Shors. He is Chancellor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Seminary and Rabbi Hermann Abramowitz Distinguished Service Professor of Jewish History and a President Emeritus of the Leo Beck Institute New York. As Chancellor of JTS, he was the driving force for academic excellence and educational outreach, and he was a spokesperson for a multi multitude of social and political issues. He was ordained uh, at JTS, holds master's degrees from JTS and Columbia University, and was awarded a PhD in history by, um, at Columbia. He holds the honor honorary doctorate of the Russian State University for the Humanities, an honorary doctorate of Tufts University, he received the Leo Beck Medal in 2015, the Moses Mendelssohn Prize by the city of Dessau in 2018. And since retiring as the Chancellor in 2006, Professor Schorz has focused on scholarship, visible in countless articles and two book publications. Last year, Better a Scholar Than a Prophet, Studies on the Creation of Jewish Studies, a contextual study of the origins and development of the Wissenschaft des Judentums. His biography, Leopold Sunz, Creativity and Adversity was published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2016, crowning a long list of other publications. And with this, I will close, and we are looking forward to your presentation. And thank you so much. Renata, thank you so much <coughs> for your kind words. Uh, Dr. Marcus uh, and the Leo Beck team, uh, I am moved by the exhibit devoted to Leopold Sunz. And if you want to remember what I'm about to say, simply remember this photograph. I <clears throat> Sunz is usually presented as, as a wizened old scholar who uh, dried up pouring over manuscripts. I was determined to change that uh, image, and I stumbled across a photograph of uh, Sons at midlife, uh, at the peak of his uh, career. Uh, that is why it appears on the cover, and uh, the content of the book is meant to rewrite the history of Leopold Suntz. Uh, I want to touch on a number of key milestones in his uh, emergence as the most important German Jew in the 19th century. What I mean by that accolade is that there was no one in the Jewish community in Germany who had a deeper understanding of the perilous nature of Jewish status in Germany. And how was that nature to be modified? The young Zunz in the essay that Renata a moment ago described was determined to show that the image of Judaism had to be altered. The documents that survived the Middle Ages largely transmitted the hateful, perverted image of the uh, a Judaism that had long died, that had been superseded by Christianity. That image 
could not underwrite the extension of equality to Jews in Germany. That image was in fundamental contradiction to the equality of status slowly extended to Jews in Germany. So Zunz acutely understood that for political emancipation to flourish, it had to be underwritten by a respect for Judaism. And the study of Jewish history for Zunz was aimed at altering the image of Judaism. That image could be transformed in the institution that dominated the cultural life of Germany in the 19th century, and that was the university. If the university were ready to accept the study of Jewish history, that image could be transformed and given the university's formative role in German culture, the image of Judaism could be rapidly transformed. Zunz failed. Zunz never acquired a professorship. Zunz actually lived his life on Grub Street in the 1850s when the Jewish community of uh, Berlin decided to close the teacher's seminary that he uh, headed. Uh, Moritz Steinschneider, his protege and friend, wrote to Professor Fleischer, his mentor in Leipzig, that Sunz is nearing 60 and has no job. Sunz never earned a respectable living from his scholarship. He never made it into a university, and his re-examination of the trajectory of Jewish history never received any acknowledgement in a German university. The first chair in Jewish studies in a German university is 1964 in an American university called the Free University of Berlin. It was founded by America. It was not founded by the German government. And there, for the first time, you had a chair in Jewish studies. Sons understood what needed to be done. And in order to modify that image, Sons did not go to Jewish philosophy. He did not go to the history of Jews in medicine. He did not go to the contribution of Jews to mathematics, all subjects that his protege, Moritz Steinschneider, studied extensively. Zunz did not uh, gravitate to the periphery of Jewish culture in order to change the image. He went to the heart of Jewish literature. Where was that literature created? In the synagogue. The synagogue is Zunz's formative institution, and he recovered, literally, the literature produced in the synagogue, and he did it in two ways. The first literature that he unearthed was the study of Midrash, which was the manner in which sermonic material was preserved, delivered in the synagogue. Uh, 
midrashic literature was the human interpretation of God's word. It rested heavily on scripture, but it gave voice to the sentiment of uh, those praying in the synagogue. Midrashic literature was well known. It had been transmitted through the commentary of Rashi, which rested heavily on Midrashic literature, but it had no order. It was a uh, library begging for order, and that's what Suntz provided. He showed the emergence of the field of Midrash. He showed its division into different genres of interpretation. He showed the areas, the geographic areas, where these documents uh, emanated from. That book came out in 1832. Suns was born in 1794, so he was 38 at the time of his first major contribution. And for the rest of the 19th century, his acolytes, uh, his acolytes in Central Europe investigated the specimens of Midrashic literature that Suns had identified and summarized and ordered with Suns's book in their hand. Adolf Jelinek, a brilliant young uh, Bohemian uh, scholar in the mid-century, edited some 90 small midrashim, many of which Suns had not even known. And Jelinek writes in a footnote, I am not going to repeat what Suns said about the texts that I'm going to study. I make the assumption that anyone who is interested in Midrash owns Suns's book and wouldn't dare to study these texts without his book in hand. And he says, you cannot appreciate the brilliance of Tzuntz until you look at the details of his work, until you look at the footnotes. For look how much of my own work and the work of others his scholarship anticipated. So that's the first great corpus of synagogue literature. And then in the 50s and 60s, Suns went on to write three volumes of the, a second genre of synagogue literature, and that is po po poetry, piyutim. And there is an intimate connection between uh, Midrash and Piyut, because uh, uh, in the early and middle decades of the, ninth, of the uh, medieval uh, period, uh, the 11th, 12th, those centuries of uh, medieval life, the Piyutim were based on Midrashim. They became the poetic reformulation of uh, the gems produced in Midrash. And Suns reconstructed that body of literature as he had reconstructed uh, Midrash. By the time he finished in 
the third volume, he had recovered the names of more than 1,000 Paitanin, poetic uh, writers from the Middle Ages. He had recovered some 6,000 Piutin. These were names and poems utterly unknown before it since before Tsuntz went to work. And that is the recovery of a scholar too poor to travel. The great Jewish libraries in Germany in the 19th century all gravitated to England. England was not only an imperial uh, empire, it was a cultural empire, and its libraries acquired German Jewish collections that uh, were out of reach for Zunz, who didn't have the money to travel to Cambridge or Oxford or the British Museum. Zunz didn't have the money to go to Italy. The largest number of Hebrew manuscripts were in the Vatican, were in Italian libraries, where Jews lived uh, largely in an unbroken continuity. Sunz did not come to uh, England for a serious examination of Hebrew manuscripts uh, until uh, the 1850s. And he doesn't get to Italy till the 1860s. His work was largely finished when he gained access to these treasures abroad. How did he get hold of this unknown body of literature? Through correspondence. Since had a wide network of assistants who had a little more money than he. When they traveled, he asked them to look for piyutim. He asked them to look for midrashic texts, and that's exactly what they did. And when they secured these gems, they would report back to Tsunz and often send him the manuscripts. That is the painstaking way in which Suntz managed through perseverance to gain a huge number of unknown specimens. What is the uh, methodology that Suntz introduced? It's a simple methodology. For one thing, uh, you need to gain access to new knowledge. Suns was, for a time, a young friend of Isaac Marcus Yost. They came out of the same base midrash. Uh, uh, and they were unorganized but fluent in Hebrew. They disdained the narrow curriculum of their base midrash uh, in Wolfenbüttel, but they knew Hebrew. The two of them understood that the image of Judaism had to be modified. Yost wrote a nine-volume Geschichte der Israeliten, the history of the Israelites, but it was based on old knowledge. It was based on texts that were well known. Sons veered off 
in the search of new knowledge because Suns understood that those documents that survived the Middle Ages were insufficient to modify the image. They fed the prejudices of the Catholic Church. They reinforced the anti-Judaism, which was abroad in German culture. Joost wrote what was already known. He did it in an orderly fashion, in a readable manner, with insights here and there. He produced those nine volumes in a single decade. Suns worked a lifetime to finish his search for new knowledge. It was only new knowledge that could begin to revise our image of Jewish culture. So the first method of his work was to find new material. And the second was to examine this material critically. One simply couldn't accept what uh, the authors might have said about their works. One had to look at rabbinic material critically, even biblical material critically, and certainly new documents. And the third part of his method was uh, the opening of non-Jewish sources to the reconstruction of Jewish history. There was a great deal of information about Jews in non-Jewish sources. If they were to be excluded, our knowledge would be truncated and often inaccurate. So Suns introduced a methodology. And what I want to stress is that his creation of Jewish literature went into the most dense literature that the synagogue produced. This literature was not readily accessible to assimilated Jews. It wasn't translated, it wasn't interpreted, but Suns understood that if we're going to revise our image, you can't go to the periphery. A century later, uh, Harry Austin Wolfson at Harvard in the 1920s argued that the only body of literature that the university would be interested in would be Jewish philosophy, because in the field of Jewish philosophy, there was an overlap with general philosophy. He didn't think that Talmud was suitable for the university. Suns resisted that uh, uh, temptation. He went to the heart of Jewish literature, its creativity creative impulse in Midrash and poetry in order to revise the Jewish image. That is his heroic achievement, to uh, show the non-Jewish world that Jews were capable of producing literature, that Jews were a civilized culture. Suns achieved the following result. The 19th century was uh, the uh, high mark of Moorish synagogues, grandiose structures which announced to the Gentile world, we're here and we are going to stay. These buildings are uh, permanent, but they were devoid 
of meaning. Sunsa's scholarship, his recovery of Midrash and Piyut, filled those Moorish sanctuaries with literature, which they had created. And Suns offered an understanding of the synagogue, which I think has still powerful meaning today. He understood the synagogue as a sacred arena of dialogue. If you look at the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, it consists of two works of 150 chapters. One is the Torah, and the other are Tehillim. But they are very different. The Torah is the dissemination of God's voice to Israel. And Tehillim is the lament of Israelites to God over the injustice that they have suffered, over the horrors that, that they have experienced. There is in the Tanakh itself a dialogue, and Suns argued that dialogue was transferred to the synagogue. How does it express itself? The sermon is a perpetuation of God's word. The sermon is Midrash. That is how God's word is steadily reinvigorated and expanded. The response to that voice of uh, the eternal is piyut, is the human lament over Jewish suffering. So in the synagogue itself, there is a perpetuation of the structure of the Tanakh. Torah and Tehillim, Midrash and Piyut, the synagogue is sacred because in the synagogue you have a religious dialogue between God and Israel. That, I submit to you, is a magnificent conception of the synagogue, and it is a direct uh, uh, it is a direct uh, uh, consequence of Sun Tzu's own immense textual research. The synagogue is based on Midrash and uh, Piyut. Every one of the, the volumes that uh, Tzuntz published on Piyut has the word synagogue in its title. The synagogue was the generator of Jewish meaning in the diaspora. By the end of the 19th century, Tzuntz had fallen out of favor, not in Germany, not in Central Europe, but in Odessa, because Odessa was uh, the seat of Achad Ha'am. And Achad Ha'am was uh, the leader of an, uh, a Zionist intellectual revolution. And Achad Ha'am attacked Suns and his acolytes uh, for failing to write in Hebrew, for pushing everything that they wrote about into the synagogue, for ignoring the uh, uh, vitality of the Jewish people, basically 
of writing apologetics. And that indictment of Sun Tzu's work was brought from Odessa to Jerusalem by Sholem. Sholem already in the early 1920s in Berlin had absorbed that bitter critique of Yiddish Wissenschaft, and he reinforced it by the condemnation that Wissenschaft had no sentiment for Jewish mysticism. So he intensified the critique. And in 1945, at the end of the Holocaust, Shalom saw fit to write a Hebrew essay in which he called the Wissenschaft circle the liquidators of Judaism. They wrote to bury Judaism. What they produced carried no inspiration with it. It was meant to give Judaism a decent burial. This exhibit is a refutation of that critique. Shalom brought Odessa to Jerusalem and he egregiously misled the labor of Tzuntz and those who followed him. So why is this uh, exhibit here at the Leo Beck Institute? For some very beautiful reasons. Tzuntz was saved for the world of Jewish scholarship by a teacher, Samuel Meyer Ehrenberg, who in 1807 became the director of that base midrash in Wolfenbüttel and immediately recognized the brilliance of Tzuntz and Yost, and he disciplined them. He domesticated them. He sent them to a gymnasium. He sent them to a university, and they blossomed. Both these young men remained eternally grateful to Samuel Meyer Ehrenberg. And Ehrenberg was the great grandfather of Franz Rosenzweig. If Suntz epitomized the study of history in the 19th century, Rosenzweig epitomized its repudiation in the 20th century. Rosenzweig was in correspondence with great grandchildren of Samuel Meyer Ehrenberg who had converted. In Rosenzweig's circle in Frankfurt in the 1920s, you had a young Jewish scholar by the name of Nachum Glatzer. And it is Nachum Glatzer who after the war in 1953, introduces in English Franz Rosenzweig's oeuvre to the American Jewish public. Nachum Glatzer had access to a great deal of Ehrenberg correspondence. He had the correspondence of Tzuntz to Ehrenberg. He had the correspondence of uh, Adelheid Tzuntz to the women in the Ehrenberg family. The large collection of Ehrenberg letters here at uh, the Leo Beck Institute uh, are the product of Nachum Glatzer, who was one of the great Judaic 
scholars at Brandeis. And in 1958, Glatzer edited a volume of correspondence between Zuntz, less so Joost, and the uh, Ehrenberg uh, family. Three generations of Ehrenbergs Zuntz corresponded with. And then in 1964, uh, Glatzer edited a, another magnificent volume of Zuntz correspondence with scholars all over. So the lifeline that kept Zuntz uh, vigorous, inspired, and motivated was correspondence. And this exhibit could not have been done without that correspondence. My study of Zuntz would be impoverished without that correspondence. That correspondence gives us a deep insight into the dynamics of Zuntz's scholarship. It gives us a deep insight into Zuntz's political views. Zuntz, who was uh, captivated by Jewish scholarship in 1848 and 1849, produced nothing. For two years, Zuntz uh, was active on the political front because with 1848, you get rebellions across Europe, and Suntz was convinced that this was the moment in which Germans had the possibility of achieving emancipation. Not only did Suntz not do a stitch of scholarship for two years because of the depth of his political engagement. He didn't fight for the emancipation of Jews in those two years. He traveled the length and breadth of Central Europe speaking about German emancipation, not Jewish emancipation, because Suntz understood that without German freedom, <clears throat> there could be no Jewish freedom. So for two years, he was a raging Democrat fighting for the victory of these rebellions. And when he lost, and when the conservative establishment uh, came back, he withdrew once again into his study of Piut. So it is the depth of his understanding of the Jewish situation in Germany that for me makes him the wisest German Jew of the 19th century. And I am immensely gratified with this recognition in the exhibit, and I thank you for coming. So I'm happy to take a question or two if you wish. Yes. Today? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there were, Rosenzweig's contemporary had largely converted. There probably are traces, but I, I've never looked into that. But the Ehrenberg genealogy 
in miniature is a history of Jewish assimilation. And what Suns fought for was the resistance to that. You can be a German without betraying your religious tradition. And that's what this photograph uh, conveys for me. This is a German scholar, but one who is proud of the literary creativity of Judaism through the ages. And he has children? And he has a family? Don't say, and Adelheid had no children. No, no children. No. Synagogue in Pittsburgh, which was reestablished in recent years, he showed up there and uh, sort of connected to that. Uh, Rosenzweig. Well, the Ehrenberg. Uh, oh, the Ehrenberg line. Yeah. And, uh, was he Jewish? No, he's no longer. But, um, Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, well, that's an answer. Thank you ever so much for coming.